Okay. Hello, welcome. Today we're at the V&A, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and we're here to see the Industrial Revolution 2.0, how the world will newly materialize. Uh, it's an exhibition put together for the London Design Festival by the celebrated curator Murray Moss of the Moss Gallery in New York and in collaboration with Materialize. So, well, it's starting to rain, so let's get inside and away from the bustling street and go meet Murray Moss so he could tell us a little bit more about the show. Okay, okay so uh, we're at the v &A in the VIP room and sitting next to me is Murray Moss, the celebrated gallery owner from New York. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so we're at the V&A today because of the new exhibition. So would you like to tell us what's happening here? Well, first of all, we're directed to call it an installation. An installation. An the V&A okay. is very strict about whom they allow to do exhibitions. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, how shall I begin? Yeah. So actually, um, tell us. For the Industrial Revolution 2.0, uh, how the world will newly materialize, there's a lot of 3D printing. So maybe you could begin by telling us where did this fascination for 3D printing come from? Well, it came from you. Yeah. Uh, through uh, via uh, Yoris and uh, Naomi, uh, when I saw works as early, I think, as 2004, which okay. was the Solid Collection. and. Um, uh, I am not a, tech, a technologically aware person, mm -hmm. so my introduction, which has some relevance when we talk about the exhibition, my introduction to it was through the translation of that technology or the use of the technology mm -hmm. as applied to a quite ordinary object, which is a table and a chair and a stool. And uh, although I knew something was up um, because uh, I've never seen a table or a chair or a stool look like that. Um, the introduction to it allowed me to have some common point. I knew what a table looks like, it looked like a table. So I, it was not, uh, and this what surprised me was this technology um, was not relegated or ghettoized into a, a high-tech um, industry. Uh, a medical industry or the automotive industry or the aeronautics mm -hmm. industry. But here was clearly some new technology that was applied to a very banal kind of an object, a, mm -hmm. a furniture. Yeah. And uh, so my, it, what it made me feel was, where have I been? Because usually we're introduced to technology as prototypes in these rarefied trade shows or sort of science mm -hmm. projects. And here it was already existing as a consumer product, privileged, expensive, but nonetheless available as furnishings. And that I thought was, that was what sparked my interest in it and which was a core reason, which I didn't want to forget, why we decided to introduce the technology in this incredible forum here uh, through these ordinary, let's say, genre, the ordinary categories of, of objects. Excellent. And how did this uh, opportunity at the V&A come up? How did that develop? Well, I'm personally friendly with um, Ben Evans, mm -hmm. who is the director of this London Design Festival, which for three years now has had its sort of headquarters here at the V&A. And the V&A is very slowly opened up certain, let's say, moments in the museum very strictly and controlled to allow a kind of juxtaposition or dialogue between contemporary works and these what have become our iconic symbols of the Western culture. Um, I've always thought that uh, it was uh, we were missing opportunities when new works were ghettoized, as I said about the technology, new works have been, have been consistently ghettoized to alternative locations. Mm -hmm. In England, it would be an old street or Clerkenwell and a pop-up Chinese restaurant converted for five days to this. And it positions these works as on the fringe. Mm -hmm. And what I thought, what I think is important is that occasionally, and hopefully with some intelligence, our future can be which has not arrived exactly yet, mm. can be placed bravely in just a position, fearlessly, with the icons of Western culture, so that we can prepare ourselves 
through art so is that when with a kind of familiarity of what's actually cooking out there so is that when commerce or an industrial uh, situation take may take 20 years to introduce a work to us as a finished product mm -hmm. when we're and when we encounter that we're not dumbfounded but we can welcome it we can be ready to receive it because the danger in not doing that is that we reject it and there have been many technological advances like mm -hmm. the Betamax for example yeah. where the society rejected a good thing because we weren't ready nobody prepped us for it and I think art using it in its broadest terms is the great free research and development department of industry if they use it as such so that was what I felt uh, sort of audaciously and without invitation was possibly the situation with materialize frankly yeah. which was you going so fast it's so it's so ordinary to you as mm -hmm. as as it is to most people in their work artists the same way oh that's old everybody knows that everybody knows that people don't know that there's no public forum for that and I thought if we can bring it to a public forum which is sanctioned which is the holy grail of art of Western art and place your work quietly and not as the center of attention but as sort of by the way it would be um, it would suggest to people what was suggested to me when I first saw it which was the kind of where have I been and it would be done very graciously because the work would not be about itself mm -hmm. but it would be about uh, using this technology to enable us to see historical works in, a, in illuminated so that was the sort of premise perfect well done and Thank now you. that it's uh, now that the installation has begun uh, how does it feel to see it come to fruition well uh, happy <laughs> um, what I like about it what what I took a risk with and what Joris was very brave and extremely smart and supportive um, the risk was to take an, an installation a group of these products which are only eight groups mm -hmm. and to disperse them throughout the building because people will people travel to see them you have to walk through all these galleries mm -hmm. why not keep them all together one would reinforce the next the next and the reason why I took this chance was I felt we needed to make visceral to have it be physical the fact that this technology is spreading everywhere mm -hmm. that it's there before we get there that it goes backwards in time it goes forwards in time that it's quite it will become quite ubiquitous like a vine creeping through the place so when you walk through these halls in the British galleries for example and you go from 1500 to 1600 to 1700 and you've walked and you're a little bit tired and you get there and there is is additive manufacturing I think that one could sense that it's every place in this museum that mm -hmm. it will touch meaning it will touch all the categories it will affect sculpture painting furniture lighting etc cetera, etc cetera, costumes mm -hmm. etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, that's the part that I'm happiest about because although I, th I feel that that works as a kind of a of a physicalization mm -hmm. you know? also I think um, we took a very surgical approach meaning that we we were not overly generous with each installation I chose I've been coming to this museum for 50 years probably not missing one year and I but I wanted to I have favorite places mm -hmm. and favorite objects and what I wanted to do was have the privilege the fun of actually getting to for nine days contribute and that sounds very very egotistical but I wanted to see if I could illuminate make a, a proposal about that object uh, and let somebody else do it again next time and the next time and the next time yeah. using your technology contemporary works contemporary designers to actually help us connect or reconnect to works that were historical and um, that I think for example with the Iris van Herpen Rococo mm -hmm. uh, dress is particularly I feel 
uh, I hate to say, successful with it, because you have one great object, which is a Rococo mirror circa 1750. Mm -hmm. You have one contemporary object in front of it. The aesthetics, the formal aesthetics of it, are clearly coming from the same well. They're coming from a period of excessiveness, of exuberance, of sort of peekaboo sexuality, of optimism. And um, this is embodied in the dress, which is speaking again to those situations that I believe were spoken to addressed through the Rococo period 260 years mm -hmm. prior. Yet each of them embodies its own age's technology. So the technology of the dress is not the only technology present in that dialogue. I wanted to, in, to, to have people to suggest and inspire people to consider what was this mirror a new technology in 1760, mm -hmm. that you could look many ways at an object. You could look at it from a sociological point. You could look at everything in this museum as science. Everything in this museum is technology. Everything is economic history. Everything is as political or sociological um, narrative. And, and there are the, the, a one object from the contemporary times and one object from a historical time could be worthy of an entire museum, that we go too fast we ignore those those possibilities. Okay, and uh, you mentioned the Iris van Erpen dress, but uh, do you have other favorite pieces? You say it better pieces? than I do. <laughs> I've had practice. Yes, yes, I don't. Uh, do you have other favorite pieces? Well, I particularly like. I mean, I think the Lady Belhaven. Yeah. Uh, some works require no explanation. Mm -hmm. I think the Lady Belhaven is very good as a sort of uh, uh, kind of like um, narrator for what is possible. That hall, the Hinsey Sculpture Court, is one of the hallowed grounds of the, of the Victorian Albert Museum. And it's all about figural sculpture. Sculpture, as we could basically be summed up as works which are either carved of some material, stone or wood or whatever, cast, or in more recent times, assembled, mm -hmm. assemblage. We've introduced into this historical court a fourth way of making sculpture. And it illuminates several different um, realities. One is by scanning, let me backtrack for a moment. I, I, it's, it's generally understood that most works of art were inspired or referenced a previous work of art. Mm -hmm. So is that, for example, in a piece of porcelain, a bridge might be painted. That bridge would exist somewhere in Munich, you know, mm -hmm. or it would be taken from an etching, which is common, or an ancient drawing, or an ancient statue in Rome. And But those references are often buried or camouflaged in the so-called contemporary work. Here you have a situation with Stephen Jones creating a hat for Lady Belhaven, the original sculpture being from 1827, mm -hmm where the reference point, the Statue of Lady Belhaven carved in marble 1827, is clearly present in the mm -hmm. new work. So the first thing we're doing is acknowledging that sculpture needn't hide its, its inspiration, which is new in that hall. Secondly, the fact that you can build from an existing work and uh, manipulate it in such a way that you could either travel back in time and imagine yourself in that situation, or bring that work into a contemporary dialogue. It does no offense to the original work. It just mm -hmm. allows us to meet it halfway. And I also think that it introduces a new material, not just a new process or combination of processes, which are digital processes and laser technologies, but through the additive manufacturing. But it also it, it introduces new materials in that hallowed hall in the form of the nylon and the uh, resin. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud that so much, there's so much going on within that one sort of crowd pleaser yeah. moment. It's a jaw dropper, that's yes, for sure. Yes, it is. <laughs> I've seen it. It is, because yeah. I see people, because it, 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 will, it will help to suggest, we don't know where that will lead, mm -hmm. what that will prompt, but I know it will inspire. 10,000 people will pass by and I know that it will inspire people or give ideas. If one idea is born from that, one idea that we haven't thought of, then 
then this museum is being served. Yeah. Okay, one final question. Please. Um, about additive manufacturing, where do you see it going? What are your own predictions for this technology? So, a big question for the last one. <laughs> well, that is a big question. Yeah. Um, I, as I said, am out of the technological mm -hmm. world. But the reason why even I sort of respond to it is I think it will, it's a new kind of nature. It's it's a new way of making something, that's ve that, which is quite profound, and it will go everywhere. And I think that it will change certain knowns profoundly. One is what somebody will design will, be a dig will exist in digital form, mm -hmm. not in the material world. And in that digital form, it means that you could buy a couture dress from a Paris house but what you're buying is a digital file. And the realization of that garment could be made in Tokyo, in Brazil, in New York, in London. As shops open, meaning small manufacturers, spe mm -hmm. you know, special manufacturers with this uh, printing equipment, more local, we will, the production will be divorced from the design. Mm -hmm. And what that will do instantly and I believe it will, in the history, you know, in, in the world, the time of the world, it's all relative, but it will feel instant, is it will eliminate transportation, the need of UPS or Federal Express to transport that dress, because you'll print it locally. Mm -hmm. And so our ideas of what a French couture dress is will change, because it will mean you're referring to the digital file, not to the actual product. And the product could be made locally, so it will eliminate transportation, which will affect the cost. In the bigger picture, that's the most green thing about the subject. Uh, the, 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 the economic use of the material, et cetera, et cetera, is minor, much more minor, in my you know, sort of civilian opinion, as compared to the possibilities for eliminating transportation. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your Thanks. time. It was Thanks. great talking to you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, okay.